I want to thank the City of Ann Arbor, all our sponsors that are here today, and the Rabbit Hole, of course. And then finally, I want to thank John Sinclair, who passed away this past April before Hash Bash. Thank you. Uh, without John Sinclair, we wouldn't be here right now. Hash Bash wouldn't be here. And we wouldn't have a lot of the freedoms we have in the state of Michigan. And Michigan wouldn't be looked up to like it is around the country for some of the laws that we've passed here. So thank you, John Sinclair. As we do with every Entheo Fest, um, we start our fest with the keynote speaker from the past festival. And this year it's a real big honor because I know people really loved her last year. And uh, she's a Cuban-born religious naturalist minister, a teacher, a mentor, working at the intersection of spirituality, the nervous system, and human consciousness. And she's living right here in Michigan. Please, everyone, give it up for Mariela Perez-Simmons. Hello everyone, welcome. I just want to begin by creating a sacred circle for us here today. We want to invite the spirit of the East, the rising sun, the innocence in our nature, the beauty, the air element. We welcome the spirit of the South, the fire, the passion within us. We welcome the spirit of the West, the waters, the emotions, the depth, the soul. We welcome the spirit of the North, the earth, the steadiness, the stability, the ground. We welcome the spirit from above, the inspiration of the heavens, of the universe. And we welcome the spirits from below of the ancestors of the past. And with this, we open the sacred circle for us to celebrate today. To be human, friends, to be human, to know pain, to know trauma like a creature trapped in the body to have a mind that doesn't stop, to be human, to feel so alone, to want to be accepted, to want to be understood, to want to fit in, to be human, to be extracted from, to be exhausted, to have to keep going day in and day out. To be human, to have no meaning, no purpose, no direction, to feel so lost. To be human, to have a heart, to feel the pain of the world. To have to pull yourself up to wipe your tears. To be human, to know the earth, to know her medicines to know her magic through her medicines, to know her beauty, to feel the layers of the self dissolve, to become one with that something larger, to find meaning, to find belonging, to be loved, to be love. We are here today to give thanks to celebrate, to honor, to defend the earth and her blessings, the earth and our sacred connection to her. We are here to defend our intimacy with the earth and her medicines. We are here because we are building a new earth together, a new earth where we no longer use our will power and our ego to create reality, but we use love with the help of these medicines. I want to invite you as we begin to bring your awareness to your heart center, 
or your high heart, the middle of your chest. And now think about the Earth. Think about the size of the Earth in our solar system. And now think of the sun, the size of the sun. The sun is huge. The sun is the central organizing intelligence of the solar system, the source of life that makes all of this possible. And that is what I call love, to give life and warmth. The sun is the biggest philanthropist there is. And now think about the sun in your heart, your center of intelligence, your center of self. Think of your heart as a golden sun. And so we open this circle with radiant love. May, we love, may our love reach those in our community, those who are sick and couldn't be here due to illnesses, May our love, our radiant love, reach those who are in pain. May our love stand and be felt throughout this city, throughout this land. May the wind carry our love. May our words carry it. May our deeds carry it. May it be so. Thank you so much, Mariella, for your words. You're, you're amazing. Um, uh, my name's Emily. I'm the SAPS president, the Student Association for Psychedelic Studies. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I'm super honored to uh, invite up the next speaker. We have Dr. Kevin Banky here. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center here at U of M. Uh, his research focuses on therapeutic applications of cannabis and psychedelics, and his goal is to rigorously assess appropriate use of these substances and to help address the public health harms caused by their criminalization. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Dr. Kevin. Hello, everyone. Uh, as, like, as it was last year, it is a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and it's nice that the weather showed up for this uh, lovely event as well. So as mentioned, uh, I am at the University of Michigan. I'm also part of the Michigan Psychedelic Center. And I study how cannabis and psychedelics are used for pain management. And I conduct both clinical trials, um, I'm going to move this up, and survey studies to understand how and why people use these drugs and then the outcomes of that use. Um, so I talked a little bit about it last year when we had just opened the clinical trial of psilocybin-assisted therapy for fibromyalgia. We actually finished that, um, so I'm really delighted to announce that that's done. Uh, and people reported some really remarkable healing results with this therapy helping pain, um, their mood, and then their understanding of themselves. And I, I'm just so honored to be able to contribute towards a better understanding of how psilocybin therapy might be helpful uh, for healing and of pain and then the many other conditions that it has the potential to help with. So in this vein, I'm just so grateful to the event organizers and each one of you for your advocacy work. This would not, this work that I do is not possible without the work that all of you do. Uh, and given the poor outcomes of the many existing medications for pain, for other psychi for psychiatric conditions, it's just incredibly important to learn how and when psychedelics are medically useful. The work that we're doing here today is also essential to address the ongoing societal pain and suffering caused by the prohibition of these substances at the, the federal and in some cases state level. And I believe if we really want to make the most of how we engage with these medicines, we need to end that prohibition now. So while, <laughs> uh, 
And while the Food and Drug Administration did not approve MDMA therapy for PTSD, we know from efforts like this, as well as what's going on throughout the country, that that will not stop state, city, municipal legalization efforts. And it also won't prevent people from using MDMA and psilocybin and other substances for healing because there's clearly something there that people want to, to move into and there's the potential um, of these substances to help them. So I think what's really important then is knowing that that's happening to figure out how we can support people who are choosing to do this um, in a way that is skillful, that supports their own health, that supports the health um, of the people providing the psychedelic therapy. And I'd like to help develop some of these models that could be employed immediately, even within the context of current federal law, uh, you know, where the status quo is prohibition. So in that vein, I'd also like to share some of the findings from the study that we conducted uh, last, uh, last year. We've done surveys with EntheoFest um, from 2021 through 2023. We've had, I think at this point, seven or eight papers that have been published um, in peer-reviewed journals at this point. So just, again, an incredible shout out to all of you for the work that you've done in getting the word out for these studies. Um, and so what we wanted to know is how psychedelic therapy is actually done uh, outside of clinical trials. What do people do? What therapeutic modalities do they employ? Uh, do they do preparation and integration therapy? All those sorts of things. And actually the paper coincidentally just came out this week um, and you showed us that uh, these therapies are actually offered similarly to how they're done in clinical trials but with more flexibility allowing for group or individual therapy. Um, and then the ability to employ different substances for different conditions and tailoring the amount of therapy to uh, each individual's needs. So these results demonstrated the importance also of careful screening of clients. So this is something that almost everybody who took this survey said that they need to make sure that they can build rapport and can work safely with the client um, who, who they're working with, both for their own safely, safety and the safety of the, of the practitioner uh, and the client themselves. So our team is so grateful for your continued and thoughtful responses to our surveys that have helped us better understand how and why people use these drugs so that we can share them back with you, but then also with policymakers, with other scientists, um, and uh, whoever else wants to learn about this as we continue in this work so in closing, uh, I just am so grateful again to be here and thank all of you for helping contribute towards figuring out how to thoughtfully use entheogens and to b build the appropriate societal and interpersonal supports to maximize the benefits from their use. These ancient and powerful medicines have great therapeutic potential and may be a tool that help us re reconnect more fully with ourselves and with our living planet. With that, thank you all for your kind attention, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Give it up again for Kevin Banky, everybody. Yes. So we, we couldn't do all this without our people in Lansing, and one of our, our most incredible supporters for whether it be cannabis or plant medicines and mushrooms, is Senator Jeff Irwin. Thank you, yeah. Uh, he's serving his second term in the Michigan Senate, representing the 15th Senate District, which includes Ypsilanti, right here in Ann Arbor, Tecumseh, Celine, and Milan, Manchester, and the surrounding, oops, townships. Um, he represented the city of Ann Arbor and the Michigan House of Representatives from 2011 to 2017 and served on the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners from 1999 to 2010. <laughs> Senator Irwin is a chair of the Senate Housing and Human Services Committee, as well as the Environment, Great Lakes, uh, and Energy Appropriations Subcommittee. Everybody, please welcome and thank you for, for I'll do that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for being here. 
Welcome to the beautiful Diag at the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor. It is such a pleasure to represent this community in the Michigan Senate. My name is Jeff Irwin. I am the state senator for this area. Welcome to my district. That's why I wore the jacket. Uh, so yeah, thanks for um, thanks for welcoming me into this space again. Uh, and uh, as Jim said, uh, this is a particularly appropriate place for us to be gathering because this has been the site of so many gatherings to fight for our freedom uh, to use plant medicine. Sure. So, uh, you know, this has been the site of so many of these gatherings. I'm glad to be here at EntheoFest 2024 to again talk about my legislation, which would decriminalize the use of entheogenic substances here in the state of Michigan. Senate Bill 499, which I introduced last year, would mean that no one in the state of Michigan would have to go to jail for using entheogenic substances, for using plant medicine. And this is what we need to be fighting for here in the state of Michigan. We've won battles like this before, and we can win battles like this again. And we're going to do it because of people like you, people like you who are willing to show up at events like this, who are willing to join arms and coalition, and who are willing to reach out to your lawmakers to ask them, what do they think? Do they think some people here in Michigan should go to jail for using psilocybin? Do they think people here in the state of Michigan deserve incarceration for using plant medicine that they think uh, works best for them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And when we ask that question of our elected leaders, it's a very powerful question because there's only one right answer. Should people go to jail? for using psilocybin? Absolutely not, hell no, not in the state of Michigan, it's wrong. There's only one right answer to this question, so that's what I'm asking you today, is to ask that question. Ask that question of your city council people, of your county prosecutors, of your mayors, of your sheriffs. Ask that question of your state representatives and your state senators. Ask them if they support Senate Bill 499 in Lansing, because right now, this is an issue that we've been working on for a number of years, but it's not on the agenda. And because there's only one right answer to that question, our job is to get it on the agenda. Our job is to make sure that these politicians, these people who run for office, these people who seek your votes so that they can work for you, make sure they answer this question. Should people go to jail in Michigan for using psilocybin? Hell no. Hell no. Do you support Senate Bill 499? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I want to thank you for being willing to ask those questions. And I just want to talk to you a little bit more about why I'm doing this. One, uh, we have a horrible war on drugs in this country. It's a war against our people and it needs to end, full stop. But also, thank you. Also, when we talk about particularly these entheogenic substances, these substances have special value to humans. And we need to understand that these substances have been used beneficially for thousands of years. They have been very significant to human religious and cultural practices. And they have a very low propensity for abuse. And when you look at what they do physiologically, they're not particularly harmful substances. And so when you've got substances like this that show such great promise, it's particularly important that we rally together to fight for the freedom to have access to them. It's particularly important that we rally together at places like the University of Michigan to point out with a bright light that these substances have tremendous promise for human health and flourishing and we should be researching them at places like the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kevin. And we need to keep raising our voices to make sure that this question is unavoidable. So as we get going towards this next 50 days, towards this election, there's a lot to think about. And I hope that you're thinking deeply about your role as a citizen and how you're gonna vote and who you're gonna vote for. And I'm asking you as I conclude that while you're on that mission to fulfill your role as a citizen and decide who you're gonna vote for and why, make sure you ask these officials at every level, do you think people should go to jail for using 
entheogenic substances, or do you think the people in Michigan should have the freedom to use these substances as they want? Do you think we should have the freedom to research the benefits of these substances for human flourishing? Uh, and, and if you help me in asking those questions of our elected leaders, we'll be a couple steps further down the road to getting this on the agenda and making sure that we can fully ask this question on the floor of the Michigan legislature, because there's only one right answer to the question. Should people go to jail for using entheogens? No. Thank you. Thank you. So it's always a pleasure to join you here at Anthea Fest, and it's great to be here for 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Senator. Yeah. Thank you so much, Senator. Appreciate you. All right. Up next, uh, I would love to introduce to you uh, Baba Mudu Baki. Uh, he works with uh, Decrim Nature. He's a national board member. He is also a director with uh, the Detroit Psychedelic Society and co-founder of the Per Ankh Detroit Entheogenic Church. We're so excited to have you. Um, he's been a student of entheogens for two decades as a cultivator, as a researcher, um, and as an advocate. Uh, and he has further continued his studies of ancient human history, metacognition, and entheogens via travel on several continents. Um, so please give it up for Baba Mudu Baki. I think we saw you here. Mudu? I see some people coming forward. Hi. Give it up for Mudu. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Greetings, Diag. How's everybody doing? <laughs> My apologies for the delay. I got a little mixed up on campus, but it's just good to be here once again uh, celebrating uh, our right, our divine right, our sovereign right, to our state of consciousness. And that's what we're here to celebrate. This year has been filled with a whole lot of motion in the ocean, as I like to say. Everything from uh, legislative decisions on a federal level to local movements that are sprouting new. Uh, everything from our great county of Washington, Washington. Thank you. All the way to the unfortunate uh, decision makings of some of our federal uh, agencies. But we remain steadfast and we are here. For those of us who don't know me, my name is Mudu Baki. I am spokesperson for Detroit Psychedelic Society. I am a spokesperson for Decrim National. And uh, I'm your friend and brother in this movement to continue and expand access. I've been able to meet so many great people in this movement from all different walks of life. And I must say that I've never been able to interact with a more just diverse group. I'm talking age, race, income, region, and I've never seen anything that's more unifying than this movement. And so I stand here in pride to represent my region of Detroit and to also just galvanize this movement, this energetic movement that we're with. Sometimes the discussion over what we're doing and why we're doing it gets confused. We always must remember that this is a fight for the re-control, the re-regulation, the re-ability to recognize the human spirit. We must not get caught up in the ideas of politics and economics, though these are part of everyday life. 
We are ultimately pushing for the sovereignty and the reestablishment of a free human spirit. And so for those of us who are citizens of this republic, of this very aggressive and many say oppressive republic, our greatest duty is to be voices for those oppressed peoples around the world and those oppressed communities. My greatest hope is that we use our leverage wherever we may find it, from whatever political stratum that we may find ourselves, to speak for voices who do not have a voice. We are essentially the leverage to power around the globe. We are essentially charged with the responsibility of changing very powerful and very influential minds. Let us not make light of this thing we are in because the globe is depending on us. I know it sounds a little extreme, but the survival of every living creature on the planet Earth, down to the microorganisms, those of you know soil science, is depending on our ability to mature the human spirit. And though we revel in the wonder and the glory of our experiences, let us not remember that we are engaged in an existential crisis of the human spirit. And in this, let's not get caught up in notions, like I say, of politics, of economics, of personal ego, of political ego. Let us not sit smug as citizens of, like I say, a very rich, oppressive republic, satisfied that we have created freedom in our little domicile, but we must extend this freedom around the globe. We must be the change makers for the power people. And so I make this appeal that we return to those days that not only do we celebrate conditions of spirit, but we also address real conditions of the human condition. And so if your psychedelics is impaired to real political movements, your psychedelics is bullshit. I said it. If you are not organized with the collective, I don't care if it's a chess playing collective, tennis playing collective, if you are not organized with a collective of human beings, you are operating in individualism. This doesn't describe how you must operate, but you must find a way to connect with other human beings. I don't care if it's a crochet club, a tea club. If you are not part of a collective human uh, group that's holding each other accountable and pushing each other to higher expressions, you are BSing. So let us connect our psychedelics with our daily politics, our daily life, and our daily connection with real people. And let us celebrate. Let's give ourselves a hand. Let's recognize the luminaries that have propelled us to where we are. And let us support the future luminaries, our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors. Let's make sure that we spread the word to them so we can grow this movement. And I'm gonna continue pushing the best I can. And I ask that all of you as members of our greater psychedelic community that you hold me and you hold each other to a higher accountability. But we do so with patience and we do so with measured understanding because we cannot afford to fracture our movement. There's so many brilliant minds in this audience who unfortunately are not in unification over simple ideas. So I'm calling that all of our petty differences be smoothed over, all of our egotistic notions be laid to the side, and that we move toward more revolutionary liberation zeal because this is a movement of revolution. This is not a movement to just celebrate American mediocrity and global oppression. So with that, I say peace to everybody. With that, I say let's create a beautiful psychedelic future and with that, like I say, let's connect your psychedelics with real life human politics and real life human maturity efforts. And with that, I say peace to the family. Thank you, Baba Mudu. Thank you. These always fall when I get up here. Folks, we've got our next speaker coming up. Um, he's been a staple at Hashbash. He's been a staple at EntheoFest. Uh, he was on the board that helped decriminalize the entheogens and mushrooms here in the city of Ann Arbor back in 2020. He's been in Ann Arbor for quite a while. He's a, for 30 years, he taught kindergarten. And back in the early 70s, he was part of the community that helped bring that first cannabis law to our country 
when it became a five dollar and civil infraction for having cannabis in Ann Arbor. And we have Chuck to thank for that. Chuck Ream, can you come up now, sir? Please welcome to the stage, guys, and give him a big round. Chuck Ream. Thank you, sir. Hey. I'm just a kindergarten teacher, and it's a great joy to be able to still be here and do this. I'm 77 years old, and I have used cannabis and, thank you so much, cannabis and psychedelics very beneficially for 57 years, and I don't seem to be degenerating from that situation. Welcome to our city of Ann Arbor, which has liberated cannabis and psychedelics as much as any city on the earth. Ann Arbor was the first place on the planet to basically legalize cannabis with a $5 fine of 1972. Those of us who were in the Human Rights Party, prodded on every minute by John Sinclair, made it happen. LSD, LSD and mushrooms showed up for many of us in 1968, and we knew that psychedelics were the greatest thing ever. They blasted away repressive social prior conditioning and revealed a reality that was obviously more pure, more real, and more holy than everyday perception. Psychedelics carry with them the urge to pacify and to purify, to make whole, to love nature, to merge into an ecstatic oneness. After a psychedelic initiation, you are never the same again like you could never be a virgin again. You know about a deeper dimension in the 1960s, we thought we were doing something epic and brand new with psychedelics, when actually we were picking up the torch of wisdom, kindled in ancient times by nearly all civilized societies and then brutally extinguished by totalitarian theologies, male priests, and worshiping the word rather than personally known experience. All of the major centers around the Mediterranean basin at the time of Jesus had their mystery religions, they called them, trying to connect themselves with God, with ecstasy, and with immortality by trying to per perfect the potion that would take them there. Christianity was completely psychedelic and run by women for the first three centuries until taken over by Rome. We are the true heirs of ancient Western civilization. Church terrorism and witch burnings stamped out plant-based psychedelic knowledge, finally. And this was the forbidden fruit in the Bible. And in the 1960s, we brought it back. The transformative value of psychedelics, along with their safety, is too great to ignore. Of course they can be used to help with depression, anxiety, PTSD, end-of-life worry, and so much else. But they can also be used by perfectly healthy people to see the obvious glory and beauty in life, and to feel the unity of all things, and the ultimate enlightenment in the tiniest little flower or in the grain of sand and to make an evaluation of one's psyche. If you are repressing something, it will jump right up and grab you. Right now, humans are repressing climate change. And only one, and the only question is whether it will totally wipe out humans or just wipe out civilization or whether civilization could somehow survive. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks it doesn't matter what anyone thinks about climate change. Reality, the only reality is a number. Reality is that during human evolution, there has been about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we have already kicked it up to 420. Now 420, that's an easy number to remember. But it's gone from 280 to 420, and we are just starting to feel the effects of it. And what will happen when we pump it up to 520 or 620 or 720? Well, long before that, we would have heat, death, and hunger, and rising water, and drowning, and wildfire, 
dying oceans, unbreathable air, economic decline and collapse. But let's face it, we know the human psyche. Long before that, facing a decline in living standards, humans will get so frustrated they will create terminal nuclear war. Human beings are marching lockstep toward destruction of themselves and nearly everything else. And as Einstein implied, only a full, full-blown change in consciousness could allow any solution to emerge. In the psychedelic state, you can feel so connected to life that you want to protect it. You feel ready to sacrifice a bit to preserve the nurturance of Mother Earth. The Earth will become less habitable. It will be depressing. In the future, and I'm going to talk a little about the future because I'm not going to be here for very much longer. Psychedelics have to be legalized and marketed along with other drugs because humans have to try, at least, to learn how to survive during a period of decline. Like in Huxley's novel, Brave New World, we will need a new drug that takes away all worries, makes people happy, and puts people to sleep uh, with no hangover when they take a lot of it. Yes, we will need that. But humans will also still need drugs based on psychedelics so that our spirits can soar and imagine we can be creative and feel enlightened so that we can live with less things but feel cosmic unity and maybe discover solutions. Humans need hope. And maybe they can find it on the inside, starting with sex and drugs, be, be, if it becomes a mess outdoors. We've got to avoid violence, dystopia, and nihilism. This year began with great hope for the official approval of psychedelic medicine. Then in June, the FDA rejected, rejected the application for MDMA treatment for PTSD. This is unacceptable, unacceptable. The enemies of enlightenment were able to sabotage our application with duplicity. This shows us that we might have to get political again, just like we did with cannabis. And when I helped legalize cannabis in Michigan, we hammered it out year after year after year. I put together the victory for medical marijuana in Ann Arbor in 2004, and it won by 75% of the vote. And me and my buddy Tim went on year after year to put together 24 victories in Michigan City's for cannabis. And then we won, we won statewide. And we here could do the same thing with entheogens. If the goddamn regulators don't want to regulate it, we can put it on the ballot, we can get it passed politically, we can get it approved one way or the other. Working with decriminalized nature, we've already passed our issue at the city council level in three Michigan cities, and at the ballot box in Detroit, at the 61% level. Boys and girls, that's a landslide in politics. The voters are with us, our civilization needs the gifts we bring, and normalization of psychedelics in our culture will happen. The power of human beings is nearly godly. Now we need wisdom that is correspondingly strong and easily available. Psychedelics are about the only known way that humans could change consciousness enough to adapt to a new reality. In tiny doses or huge doses, we must spread our miracle far and wide for the benefit of all life. Thank you so much. Chuck Room, everybody. Yeah. Part of our planning committee, our next speaker has been so helpful this year with Entheofest. Um, she's also an advocate and mother, founding member of Decrim Nature Hazel Park, which decriminalized just a few years ago, correct? 
Um, she's been advocating for decriminalization of entheogenic plants for the last six years. She's a member of the Detroit Psychedelic Society and continues to provide educational classes regarding cultivating and integration in the Detroit area. Please, everyone, welcome Shan Vicious. Have fun, sweetie. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'm really excited to be here. This is our fourth year of EntheoFest. <laughs> Thank you for everyone for coming out. I just want to basically emphasize the same things that Chuck and Modu both emphasize, which is making sure that we have a community connection here. We need to understand that 40% of American adults don't have access to health care. They don't have access or affordability to insurance. Entheogenic plants might be the answer for some people to work their problems out and find solutions for their mental health issues. If we help provide access for these adults and creating safe community containers so that people can talk about and integrate these lessons in their daily life, we could really change the world one person at a time. I'm a mother of two. I've been using my platform to showcase how I integrate these plant medicines in my daily life. I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to do the same. When you vote, Make sure you're voting for the city council members that are supporting your ideals. I went to the Hazel Park City Council directly and I told them what I was going through and I asked for help. You guys all have the same ability to do the same in your own cities, in your own townships, all across Michigan. So support Decrim Nature. Start your own Decrim Nature chapters in your own cities if you have to. And yeah, we're gonna keep the movement going and everybody, uh, have a good time today and decriminalize nature. Thank you. Shan Vicious, everybody. Thank you, Shan. Oh, gosh, we mentioned this gentleman earlier today. He's the county prosecutor of Washtenaw County. His name's Ellie Savitt. And He's a, his fourth year term uh, began in 2021, so next year we have to look out for Ellie, right? He's a former law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor. And he was a civil rights and public interest attorney and started his career as a public school teacher. He, started, he also brought out the entheogen policy for the entire county of Washtenaw. Uh, after the city of Ann Arbor decriminalized, he made the entire county of Washington decriminalized. So we're really happy to have him. Everyone, please welcome County Prosecutor Ellie Savitt. Well, well thank you. Uh, for those who are out of town, who are from out of town, welcome to Ann Arbor where you don't have to worry about getting prosecuted for possessing entheogens. And just to reiterate the point, for those who are from out of county, welcome to Washtenaw County, where you don't have to worry about getting prosecuted for entheogens. And I'll tell you, it was, it was four years ago that the Ann Arbor City Council took leadership and became the first city in Michigan to functionally decriminalize entheogenic plants. And at the time, I was the presumptive next prosecutor of Washtenaw County. And when I took office, I said, this is an easy call to extend this policy countywide. The reason for that is because we did our research. We actually looked into what entheogenic plants do. They're not associated with increased risk of violence. They're non-addictive. They're actually associated with reduced intimate partner violence in men who take them. So why are we criminalizing these in the first place? And then also, it would be fundamentally unjust for something to be essentially legal in our biggest city and not legal in Chelsea or Dexter or Ypsilanti or Pittsfield Township or any of our other great communities across Washtenaw County. So again, Welcome, and you got nothing to fear from my office while you're here. 
So the policy, our policy and Ann Arbor's policy is about four years old now, and sometimes people will ask, how's it working? And my answer to that is, well, seems to be working great. Because fundamentally, as Senator Irwin said a couple speakers ago, we're not putting people in jail anymore for possessing or using antheogenic plants. We're not crowding our legal system with people who are using medicine that they think works best for them. And to my mind, that means it's working great. And by the way, you can look around. Nothing's burned down. Things are fine. Michigan football even won a national championship net last year. That has nothing to do with uh, this, but it didn't stop it, right? But the other thing is that Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, and this group of activists have started a movement. Entheogenic plants are now functionally decriminalized in five cities across the state of Michigan, including our biggest city, the city of Detroit. And the movement continues to grow because we are recognizing as a state and as a country the absurdity of clogging our criminal system with people that are just using a plant that has real medicinal benefits. But the broader answer to that question, and I've been privileged to talk to many people since we implemented our policy, who have said, thank you. Folks who have experienced significant trauma and PTSD, survivors of domestic assault and sexual violence, uh, veterans who experience PTSD overseas who have said that these plants, these medicines have helped me get my mind right. I talked to somebody a few weeks ago who said it helped me kick my alcoholism. Why would we as a country not want to explore that? Why would we as a country not want to legalize uh, the use of entheogenic plants when it is having this profound of an effect, a beneficial effect for so, so many people? So that's the movement that we're all a part of here. That's the movement that has continued to pick up steam. We need to support the legislation in Lansing that Senator Irwin has been championing for years. And then we need to make sure that entheogens are decriminalized nationwide. That should be the end goal. Because just as it would be tremendously unjust for somebody to possess entheogenic plants in Ann Arbor, cross over the city line, go into Ypsilanti and suddenly be criminalized again, it continues to make no sense that if you leave Washtenaw County and drive to Ferndale, a place where it is decriminalized, along the way, you suddenly are subject to criminal sanctions again. And it makes no sense that when you leave the state of Michigan, that it would make no sense if you leave the state of Michigan into Ohio, you're subject to a different set of laws. So this movement is growing. We took the leadership role here in Ann Arbor, and thank you to all the activists that have been working on this for decades. But let's not stop until every community across the country enjoys the same freedom that all of you are enjoying standing here in our beautiful city of Ann Arbor and our beautiful county of Washtenaw today. Thank you. County Prosecutor Ellie Savitt, everybody. He's one of our big champions. He's like a giant cup of coffee when he's up here. It's amazing. Everybody, um, this next speaker has been uh, on the circuit speaking at so many different events. Uh, given his knowledge, Professor Mike Witte has spoken at the recent Hash Bash rallies, authored articles on spiritual benefits of mind-altering drugs, and the positive psychology of being open-hearted. He goes by Dr. Detroit. He's also attended many conferences around the country and counseled facilitators of uh, psychedelic groups uh, for self-help. And please welcome Professor Mike Witte. Consciousness, it's the key to changing your mind about your life and the world. So let's dig deep about the new mind science of psychedelics. It teaches us about consciousness, how to change our mind and transcend fear, frustration, and anger with acceptance and love. Psychoactive plants can help us change our minds for the better, to trust ourselves, to accept ourselves, to forgive ourselves, to love ourselves and this world. 
and have energy to improve the human outlook. I'm an optimist and I'm hopeful for the future. I'm in support of joyology. Joyology is my specialty. It's a new door to our mind. We can be mushroomed uh, for hope, for calm, for bravery, for courage, whether it's LSD, psilocybin, uh, DMT, the toad, or any other uh, positive, helpful, emotional healing and mental health. And in that self-confidence, you can handle the rest of the world with less stress and more skill. So set a positive, concrete intention the next time you try some psych psychedelics. Find a trusted guide and keep it simple. Be here now. Enjoy this day. Live each day uh, as if it was your last day and have great thanks and gratitude for each day of your life and you won't have to fear the future of yourself or the planet. And re let's reduce future worries and forgive our past and accept life and offer love, hope, optimism and accept death as well. Psilocybin was studied at John Hopkins Medical School and they found that people who were terrified at, at terminal cancer with, after taking psilocybin relaxed and accepted their journey and were more loving and had sweet goodbyes to their family and friends. So it does have a medical application to one of the stark things that shadows our existence, our death. Neuroscience can help us change our minds toward dying, addiction, depression, and assist in reframing our entire life, our future, with loving kindness. So just take a minute for a second here for a brief meditation. Close your eyes and have some warm and charitable thoughts about yourself. What, what are some of your best virtues? Are you a friendly person? Are you adaptable, flexible, kind, compassionate towards self and society? And how about your close family and friends? Can you think of a charitable thought to forgive a parent, a, a, a more distant brother or sister or friend that you, you need to reconcile with or accept? And finally, humanity at large. Can we indeed forgive our whole species and, and trust that we'll make it through and we won't uh, uh, turn the planet upside down. I, I'm hopeful that we can take Chuck's earlier concerns and, and turn it into gold and, and make it, you know, something m more remarkable and, and more hopeful and, and ultimately I think it'll turn out okay. So you are the pioneers of the renaissance of psychedelic science. I invite you to heal yourself first and then heal the world. And healing yourself is mental health, it's emotional health, as well as physical ailments. And it means your attitude toward your neighbors, toward the freeway for your driving, and, and, and toward the whole world, in, including people who you differ with profoundly. You can be gentle and see it as blind spots in some people that differ with you on this election or things like that. And so heal yourself, heal the world, lobby Lansing, vote this fall, uh, and look at this moment. I'm quoting Michael Pollan um, in his book, Change Your Mind. We're all spiritual pilgrims seeking insight and sustenance from psychedelics, just as we do in yoga and meditation. Both have psychological and spiritual benefits and may help in many fields of medicine, especially in mental health. So we're on a spiritual journey with the ethnogens that can help you personally feel better about being a human being and being alive and, and feel calmer Inner calm, inner peace will bring peace to the world. You'll be more peaceable with your friends. You'll even be more peaceable with people who, who, who rub your fur the wrong way. You can be a little forgiving and, and, and not react to every provocation. So let's open our hearts, love this day, love our lives, and keep on struggling to bring as much healing to this planet and to the dear species so that we all have a joyous finish. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Mike, for those words about joy and love and peace. We love it. Um, all right, next we're super excited to have another speaker from Detroit Psychedelic Society. Uh, Mama Ayana Ayi is the widow of the late, great Kalindi Ayi. She's a Detroit native um, and she's a visionary in the community and throughout the US and in Europe. And she's here to inspire women to reclaim their birthright as goddess warriors and divine mothers. And we are so honored to have her here with us. Please give it up for Mama Ayana Ayi. Ann Arbor. As we say in Detroit, what up, doe? It's good to be here. And we want to always give a high five to Ann Arbor for starting this movement or making this movement happen with decriminalized nature. This is a big deal. You have to know it's a big deal. So I'm gonna jump right into my story briefly. About 25 years ago, I was given five grams. That was my first dose. My husband said, here, take this. I was like, what is it? He said, it's mushrooms. I'm like, without the pizza? What's up? So I take the mushrooms, and it changed the trajectory of my life, OK? It just moved me in an entire direction of knowing that there's so much more that we can experience on this planet at this time in our lives than just that 3D, five sense reality. And it also activated my queen shit. And I have moved as a royal queen from that point going forward. And I say to you, you will recognize who you are when you take your journey. You know, it's always a little trepidatious before you go in, but when you go in with the correct intent, the mushrooms will answer what you're going in to do. And then they'll come along and take you where they want you to go. So as my husband, Baba Kalindi, would say, and I say, Ibaye after his name because that means respect, he would say, take your, take your dosage and then hold on to the floor, okay? So what they have done for me is to bring me into balance. When I say balance, I say emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. I am a balanced individual because of the work that I've done over the years. Now, it's not just a one and done. You gotta do some work. You know, it's not about recreation, it's about going in and coming out differently. And what you go in with and what you bring back to apply to your life here so that you can enhance your life here. We don't hang out over there where the mushrooms take us. We hang out here, but we can grab that information and bring it here and apply it to our lives and live a better life. I have a vision that psychonauts will be the example of living on this planet if we come together and be what we're supposed to be. And I know this is a cliche here, but all we need is love. And because love is so simple, we make it complicated. But if you go in and you do your work and you connect with the planet, because see, when you give your soul over to nature, she will open up and reveal her deepest secrets to you. And then you can vibe that way on this planet. So when you're looking at this beautiful blue sky with the clouds, of course, the green tree against the blue sky, the red bird in the green tree against the blue sky, that's a beautiful thing and it should turn you on but they're putting so much in front of us. Via these phones, of course, that's how we live our life. But understand, y'all, when we hold these phones the way we hold them, that third eye is being calcified. And they want it to be calcified so that you don't see what's really going on. So I say to you, the phones, we need them. They made us have to have them, but they're a mind fuck. Learn how to put them away. Turn them off, because as soon as we hear that little beep, what happens? We go to reach it for it. We're trying to see what information we miss. It's too much. And a lot of that information is negative, and they want you to stay in that negative place of fear. Fear, 
suppresses the immune system. 80% of all illnesses are emotional. So we're caught up in this thing of anxiety and fear and scared of death and dying. And um, how can you live that way when you're constantly thinking in the negative? So I've spoken on a lot of topics in regards to psychedelics, but today I wanna to push home psychedelics and integrity. And I am speaking to the growers. I am speaking to those that sell, if you do that. I don't know who that would be, but you know, those people. Um, I'm speaking to those who are therapists, who give classes. Integrity is what we need to move on if we're going to be the example for the world to see. Now, because where I sit as your OG psychedelic granny and what I'm looking at, I'm a little disappointed at what I see because you know what? I'm seeing egos. I'm seeing jealousy. I'm seeing people backbiting. I'm seeing greed. People have learned they can make a living off of this and it's turned ugly. This is sacred. The mushrooms are gonna deem us unworthy if we don't get it together and they're gonna go back under. And without this work that we have to do in order to make this planet a better place for our children and our children's children, we have to be authentic at what we're doing. And it has to be each one teach one. We can't play the game. We have to be honest with ourselves. So you growers, I'm talking to y'all that grow and allow the spores to just throw all over the place and you sell them anyway, you're wrong. I'm talking to the growers that have mold on their product and they sell them anyway, I'm talking to you. You got to stop. I'm talking to those who take the price to $5,000 for something that would be $500. You got to stop. Everybody can't do that. If we're about helping the people do what the people need to do, which is grow and be and thrive and love and live. We got to be authentic and we got to stand in our integrity. And when you stand in your integrity, then you are honoring the sacred energy of the mushrooms and all, all, of, and all the other healing entheogenics. Now, entheogen means to generate the God within. The word psychedelic means mind manifesting. The word hallucinate means to wander through your own mind. Check that out, y'all. Wander through your own mind. You get a chance to go into yourself and explore where this soul has been for the past five, 600 years of reincarnation. Because everything in that mind has experienced because of that soul. So you get a chance to how deep is that? But can you handle it? You have to be able to handle that and face some truths about yourself. So integrity, the sacred energy of the fungi, it's very, very important to stand on that. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's not sad because Baba Kalindi, he made his transition because he was ready to go. He's a time traveler. I didn't get it at the time, but at the time, he was making his transition. He was growing 18 tubs. And as his body grew weaker, those tubs grew weaker as well. He would ask me, Ayana, how are the mushrooms doing? I'm like, they're not doing so well, Baba. But every day, as he got weaker and weaker to move on out of here, those mushrooms responded to that energy. Because the mushrooms, we have a symbiotic relationship. They want to be us, they allow you to be them. And so, again, I'm talking to you growers that don't have the right frame of mind, that have an effed up attitude, that are only thinking about greed and how much money you're gonna make, those mushrooms are feeling all of that. So if you grow, you grow with a pure heart. You grow, you grow with an elevated state of consciousness. You grow in order so that you can heal the people with what you're doing. It is so damn important. So watch who you purchase from. I know with it being all out here the way that it is, you're going to pick up a pack and keep it moving. You got to know it's got to be personal. It's got to be that deep. So that is my message. Integrity, sacredness, that's what I was raised up on with this man. It was honor, integrity, and sacredness. Oh, my God, I'm breaking up. No. Baba, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I'm about to fall.
You're so beautiful. Thank you for that. Wow. Mama Ayana, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So many things there that really opened up my mind. I'm like, yeah, of course, of course. And thank you for saying all the great things that you did. Um, folks, uh, just a little heads up. We do have an after party. It's at Rabbit Hole. It's across town. It's going to start around right after we're done here. It looks like there might be a little rain that's going to come, and it's going to sprinkle for a little bit, then go away and come back around 6. So we hope people just stick around uh, until we finish here today, because uh, we are. Um, our next speaker, his name is Jamie Lowell. And Jamie has been part of many of the bills that we've, we've been uh, benefited from as far as the legalization of cannabis in the state of Michigan. Uh, Jamie's still fighting in Lansing for many causes, but today he's talking about something else. He, he's also on the board of Glenn, Michigan Normal, uh, Michigan um, ASA, Weedsters, Hashbash, and the Sinclair Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jamie Lowell. All right, happy EntheoFest, everybody. Hey, and I want to say thank you to all of the organizers of EntheoFest, Jim, the committee, SAPS, everybody. Let's hear it for them. This is awesome. And check out all the vendors and sponsors who are out here. And I also really appreciate all the speakers and been learning a lot, a lot of great information. Uh, today I want to spend some time, though, highlighting a couple of people who are no longer with us. And this would be a good time, too, I guess, for anybody to reflect or pay tribute to anybody who's in your mind or who you think uh, would deserve it right now. Um, if anybody was here last year, they got to see the last time that John Sinclair addressed people here at the Diag. If uh, anyone was here uh, at the Hash Bash before that, that was the last time that Rick Thompson addressed everybody here at the Diag. And both have been instrumental in, in uh, both of these great gatherings. And this is the fourth one and obviously another success. So I'm happy to be able to highlight uh, both John Sinclair and Rick Thompson. And I have a couple notes here so I can kind of get through this a little efficiently and without getting too sidetracked. So bear with me on that. But uh, John Sinclair was a pioneer of the cannabis reform movement. He stood as a beacon of resistance in an area when challenging unjust laws was an act of courage. His activism was about more than just legal change. It was about defending culture, protecting freedom, and ensuring that plant medicines like cannabis and like all other entheogens were accessible to all. He fought not just for the personal rights, but for a future where the healing potential of these plants could be realized by everyone free from corporate greed. Rick Thompson. In more recent times, Rick Thompson carried this torch with the same kind of passion. Rick was consistent, it was a consistent advocate, ensuring that the cannabis industry grew with integrity, never losing sight of the original ideals that this movement was built upon. Rick stood firmly against the takeover of the industry by those more focused on profit than the people who depend on these medicines. Both John and Rick remind us of what this movement is really about justice, accessibility, and resisting the forces of greed. They have shaped the different eras of cannabis reform in Michigan, and we owe much of our progress to their unshakable belief that plant medicines should remain in the hands of the people. So I just want to end by asking you to join me in letting Rick and John and everybody else who we're thinking about really know how we feel about them. So at the count of three, just please let it go and, and, and let them hear you. One, two, three. All right, everybody. Thank you. All right. Ooh, I just felt a drop. But we're warding it off. No rain today. Um, <laughs> uh, so up next, uh, we have... Uh, Libertad McLimans. She was raised in Cali, Colombia, and she is of the Embaracatio tribe. Uh, for Libertad, as for many indigenous women, medicine ceremonies and beadwork is an extension of her spirituality, and we are so, so thankful to have her with us. Give it up for Libertad.
Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be today here sharing with you a little part of my life, what I'm passionate about. Um, I have never tried any of the intiogen plants as recreation, recreational way. I was introduced when I was 24 years old in the world of the medicine ceremonies. So it's very interesting for me to hear that you are trying to legalize these medicines here in the United States because in my country they are legal and they belong to the indigenous people. They have been carrying these altars for millennials. For us it's not uh, a new thing. It's not something that we're trying. It's something that is part of ourselves. So uh, today I want to share um, the importance of an altar when you're taking these medicines. For us, our medicine, they are not just plans to have visions. When we talk about an altar, it's a symbolic thing. It doesn't have to be something that is absolutely physical because it carries spirits from the generations that have been working with that medicine before. So when you go to a medicine ceremony, please make sure that you know where that altar is coming from. Where in, a, I don't know, in the jungle, in the mountains, where this is coming from. We use these altars very secretly. And so when we don't have this support, when we don't have these altars as support in this kind of medicine, I have seen a lot of people just getting lost. We talk about being legal, let people use it, let people uh, get healed with it. But let me tell you something. If you don't take it in the sacred way, you can get lost. You can damage yourself. So I invite all of you to find around your communities. There's so many people that have been trained for years and years and years, go to South America, go to the jungle, go and experience the medicine where the medicine comes from. It's so, so, so important. We have here uh, uh, Liliana Aldana. She carries a beautiful uh, altar medicine of the ayahuasca, which I know as Yahé in my country. Look for those people. Look for the sacredness of it. I'm a I was empty when I found this path, even though I'm indigenous. I was empty, and when I found these ways, it wasn't just like this, it wasn't magical. It didn't change one day to the other. But praying with my, with my elders, praying with the medicine, I have reached this path in my life, this moment in my life, when I'm not completely whole, I'm not completely happy, I'm not, different than you are. I have struggles, I have challenges every day. But certainly when I'm walking my prayers, it feels totally different. So I invite you today uh, to go and find that sacredness. Go and find that people that is carrying altars for millennials, right? Funny enough, I come from the Embera Catillo people, which is the the people that has been safeguarding the medicine of the mushrooms for millennials in the mountains of Colombia. I've been working with this altar for so long and I carry myself the altar. And one of the things when the altar was given to me to be able to share with other people, the medicine itself told me, please don't share me when I've been grown by a man. It's really very, very important that when we're using this medicine, it comes with the entire universe inside of it. And how we get the universe inside of our little, little, little mushroom when it grows outside, when it comes from with the sun, with the rain, with the bugs, with everything that makes part of that soil, that what is make a medicine, medicine. When we grow the medicine inside of walls, it grows only with the thoughts and the feelings of the person that is growing the medicine. We're losing everything else. 
We don't have the universe. And we talk about healing. We cannot heal from, from somebody's emotions. We cannot heal from somebody's thoughts. We can heal from the universe, the medicine that the universe is giving to us. So that's my message today. Please go and find that person that carries the altar because it's really, really, really important. They are instruments, they are um, tools, they are songs that are specifically for every single medicine. We don't mix them. The mix of the, of the, the songs from medicine to medicine, I know is very huge here, the ayahuasca and the mushrooms. When we use the Icaros is the way you know them here, of this medicine, mushrooms, and we bring them to the ayahuasca, your spirit is gonna be confused because those spirits don't belong to that altar. So please, I want everybody to try these medicines. They are so amazing, but please be careful. If you wanna heal, find that altar that is gonna help you to heal. Uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be taking it in your house or you shouldn't be doing uh, in therapeutic sp sp spaces. And I'm not saying that, but please find somebody that has that spiritual or yeah, that support from the other side. If you get lost, that person or those spirits are able to bring you back here and actually heal yourself. Thank you so much. Give it up for Libertad, everybody. Just a little sprinkle. I'm going to leave this. This is actually left here a couple years ago at the Entheo Fest. Um, if anyone wants to use it, please have at it. So our next speaker I'm really honored to bring up. Um, he's got an incredible story, and I don't want to break into it and steal his thunder. Hopefully, you don't have any thunder. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please bring it, give it up for this gentleman, Brandon Hillaker. Thanks, Brandon. And Brandon, by the way, just got back from doing his 11th triathlon this year. Thank you. My name is Brandon. I am diagnosed with ADHD, borderline personality disorder, and bipolar one. Growing up, these disabilities made life very challenging for me. I made a lot of wrong choices. I dropped out of school. I ended up in jail and prison. In 2005, I overcame those obstacles and went to school for my childhood dream to become an underwater welder. In 2013, the adrenaline-packed lifestyle of an underwater welder, a biker, and some life triggers triggered a manic episode so bad that I killed myself. I died, I was brought back to life, and I laid in the coma for two weeks. When I woke up, life was drastically different. I had severe brain damage. I had to learn to walk again, talk again, and communicate with people again. I had to quit my dream job as a diver and go on permanent disability. I tried to escape the pain of my mental illness and created more obstacles. I had lupus in my hands. I had severe vertigo. My hands shook so bad that my wife had to feed me at the dinner table. In 2015, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, 33 years old. This triggered a manic episode so severe that I reached a state of psychosis and I was hearing voices for five months. Not being able to stand the voices anymore, I stabbed a pair of scissors through my hand in hopes to quiet them. From 2013 to 2022, I was in and out of mental inpatient hospitals four to six times a year due to treatment-resistant bipolar. I put myself through cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical therapy, talk therapy, group therapy, physical therapy, from 2005 to 2022, I was prescribed 40 psych medications, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, antidepressants, a lot of benzos. 
Yet I was still going to the inpatient four to six times a year. Nothing worked. I was broken, beaten, and dying inside. I reached a point of researching assisted suicide because I failed the first time and did not want to do that again. I wanted to die. I did not want to live anymore. In the early summer of 2022, a more homeopathic approach to my mental illness found me and changed my life. It allowed the lion to come out again. I was laying in a hammock in the woods, and we'll call it kind of a happy hippie fest. A young lady came to me and said, do you want some magic mushrooms? I was very apprehensive about this because of some, my past with psychedelics. However, I said, you know, I'm dead inside. I don't care anymore. And I ate those mushrooms and those mushrooms changed my life. When I ate those mushrooms, I didn't see little green men. I didn't see leprechauns and rainbows. I just felt amazing. I felt like whatever was going to happen, it was going to be okay. Fascinated by this, I ran home and I told my wife all about it. I explained I don't know what happened, but I need to figure out what and why it happened. Why I felt so alive. My investigation took me down a colorful rabbit hole from research from John Hopkins University and other major organizations that was researching psilocybin and bipolar. So I sat down with my wife and my doctor and I explained it like this. My medications, they don't work. We have two choices. I'm going to kill myself or we are going to do something drastically different in hopes that it'll work because if it doesn't, I'm going to kill myself. I am going to come off all my medications one by one and I will do it slowly and under supervision. The response was, we support you, but plan on going manic and plan on going to the hospital. So I started my psilocybin journey. Coming off my first medication took approximately six weeks. There was no side effects, no hospitalizations, and no manic episodes. My second medication took another six weeks. No side effects, no manic episodes, no hospitalizations. My third and fourth medications took another 12 weeks, no hospitalizations, no manic episodes. My lupus in my hands was gone. My vertigo was gone. My tremors were gone. Each of these were side effects of the pharmaceutical medications I was on. Now, I'd like to play a devil's advocate and say, could this be a placebo effect? Maybe. However, I still had bipolar symptoms. I was still feeling mania and manic episodes. I was still feeling the roller coaster of bipolar. But they were manageable with psilocybin. And manageable is the key word. This did not happen with zero obstacles. Being off medication for the first time in 25 years was very difficult. I was feeling emotions that I've never felt before. There was a disconnect to who I was and who I am. And then things got very interesting. I was doing great. I was feeling great. I loved being alive. I told my wife I wanted to go back to school. I hate being on disability and I hate not working. And these very things are triggers for my bipolar. Now I would like to fast forward two years. I have completed 38 credits at Delta College. I have earned a 3.987 GPA. I have earned my place on three president's list and one vice president's list. I have earned two scholarships. I have earned the Don Hellog Emerging Writing Award. I have earned the Michigan Rehabilitation Champion Award. I have started a mental health movement at Delta College by writing a paper to improve mental health services for my fellow students to overcome their mental health and achieve their goals. I put together a mental health fair at Delta College that brought in mental health resources to my fellow students. I have worked to give staff and faculty the opportunity to be mental health first aid trained, to provide students a safe space to talk about their mental health in a safe, non-judgmental environment. I am a member of Honor Society. I am the president of Psychology Club. I am the founder and president of the Tri-Sport Club, which gives college students the resource training and support they need to pursue their endurance goals. 
I have had the opportunity to present my accomplishments to the state of Michigan and have been able to successfully expunge my entire criminal record. And this leads me to why I'm wearing this, like all these medals and this outfit. In the summer of 2023, I saw a poster on the wall that said triathlon. I weighed 280 pounds, I ate pizza five days a week, and I drank a 12 pack of pop a week. I was not healthy. I had just proved all the medical professionals wrong. They told me to sit at home, give up on my goals, give up on my dreams, take the medicine and survive my disability. I texted my wife and said, I'm going to complete a triathlon. She asked me, are you manic? So I trained vigorously for five months. I crossed that finish line September of last year. When I crossed that finish line, I looked at my wife and was like, when's the next one? I had no idea the positive, profound impact that this idea was going to have on my mental health. Bipolar is a chemical imbalance. Training for triathlons balanced the imbalance similar to the way that psilocybin did. So five months ago, I decided to challenge myself to see if I could do so much vigorous activity and training my imbalance that training would balance the imbalance. I challenged myself to complete 11 medals for the 11 years that bipolar took over my life. And today, this morning, a couple hours ago, I finished that and I achieved my 11th medal. Thank you. In four months, I completed 10 triathlons and a nine and a half mile swim around Mackinac Island. The amount of drive, motivation, and determination that this has taken me to train was one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life, all while successfully managing my bipolar and mental health. Next summer is the 50th anniversary of the Edmund Fitzgerald, the ship that sank in Lake Superior. I, along with 67 other endurance athletes, will finish the ship's 411 mile journey in a 17 stage relay swim from on top of the ship to Detroit, Michigan. Because of my obstacles in my life, I was always told what I can and cannot accomplish. Because of this, I viewed my obstacles as disabilities that I could never overcome. I allowed my disabilities to define me rather than seeing them as obstacles I can overcome. I used my disabilities as an excuse of why I could not accomplish my goals. Obstacles are not set in a place for us to give up on our goals and our dreams. Obstacles are set into our lives to be overcome and to learn the valuable lessons through this journey. I was able to overcome my obstacles in my life because of a medicine that has been on the planet longer than the human civilization. I am achieving, inspiring, succeeding, motivating, and breaking the stigma because of this fantastic molecule. I am on a journey now to have a better understanding of why and how this amazing molecule saved my life. I will one day come to this very school. I will achieve the honor of having a PhD, and I will answer the questions that I am looking for through my own journey and remembrance for all of those who aren't here anymore. Thank you. Give it up for Brandon Hillaker, everybody. What an incredible, inspirational story. Everybody, um, the next person we're about to bring up is a great person that you should know and get to know. Alicia Dyer is a homegrown community organizer by trade, a former police officer, social worker, and is Washtenaw County's next sheriff. Please give it up for Alicia Dyer. All right, how's everyone doing out there? So for anyone that doesn't know me, um, I uh, just got done running a pretty competitive primary campaign and it was very people driven and I have a background in being an ally for ending the war on drugs. As a graduate student here at the University of Michigan, I was in Students for Sensible Drug Policy and as the next, as the next sheriff of Washtenaw County, starting January 1st, I am an ally, allyship with the prosecutor's office to where I do not believe that we should be criminalizing plants period, um, and 
the more that we collectively fight to change this, the better. And what I always say is, let's imagine we just wiped the legal system and had to design it again. And we had to figure out like what is gonna be legal and what is not gonna be legal. I don't think anybody would mess with plants. I don't think it would be anyone's objective to send cops to go harass people that are using plants, oftentimes for medicinal reasons, but for whatever reason, having cops go out to criminalize people for making choices on their bodies is, is archaic, it is rooted in racism and classism and oppression, and it's not something that I support as the next sheriff, and I'm going to be doing everything in my power to advance this, just locally as well as at the state level, so we can have a better, a, a better world and a better country here, and um, I definitely fully support it. The other thing I'll say is I served in law enforcement for many years, and you develop a lot of trauma responding to people in crisis over and over and over again. Many cops have PTSD, just like you know everyone else in society. And if we know that um, you know certain types of plants and other things can help with PTSD, why are we criminalizing it and making it illegal? Because when we do that, we actually halt progress to actually give people treatment to help make them better. And so, you know, there's another um, organization, it's called the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and they're fighting nationally to advance some of these policies because it's important. And if you can't, if you really care about public safety, you'd care about making sure people's needs are met and people can actually be their best selves in this world. Um, I want to thank everyone here um, for all the work that you do and putting this on, as well as our elected officials and other allies that are fighting across the country to advance this work. And I also want to thank everybody here that was supportive of my campaign. Um, you know, it was a very uh, tense battle, and you know, there's a long way to go when you think about sheriffs. We have progressive prosecutors, but when you think about progressive sheriffs, uh, it's not really a thing yet. And so, the more that we can get leaders and spaces of power that are going to be with the people instead of corporations and, and political greed and, and a host of other things, the better that we can all be as a society. So thank you so much. That's the, uh, the sheriff that's going to be in town here soon, folks. That's great. Thank you, Alicia. Everybody, our next speaker, uh, without her, we wouldn't have our decrim uh, resolution here in Ann Arbor because she was the first one to bring it to vote when she was a city council member in Ann Arbor. Please welcome Ann Bannister, everybody. Thanks, Ann. Thanks. I like your name tag. Thank you. What's up, Fest? Thank you to all of the grassroots activists, elected officials, and medical professionals here today. There's too many people to thank, but the list includes Cornelius Corn Williams from the Decriminalize Nature Michigan chapter. They're over here with the green tent on the side. I, please stop by. A special thank you to the University of Michigan's Michigan Psychedelic Center and Dr. George Mashour, who is coming up on our speaking next down the line. And a big thank you, of course, to Jim Salame and Emily Barriman, who is the president of the University of Michigan Students, uh, Student Association for Psychedelic Studies. Each one of us here today are pioneers and champions to help make decriminalize nature and truly make an impact on our shared goals of raising awareness and building and growing our community in the, in the growing industry of entheogenic plant use. We're on a mission together to improve human health and well-being through political and community organizing, education, and advocacy. I'd like to tell the story of how, in 2020, Ann Arbor became the first city in Michigan and the fourth city nationwide to pass the resolution of decriminalizing and making uh, entheogenic plants the lowest law enforcement priority. And I tell this story in hopes that 
we will inspire other elected officials and other grassroots, grassroots activists to begin a movement in your city. The first step is what we're doing here today. Network with like-minded people. And before you leave today, visit the Decrim Michigan uh, booth with the green tent here on the side. They have a QR code for you to join the Google group. And, uh, and there's a lot of information in that Google group, everything you need. So I first learned about the decriminalized nature movement in 2019. When, uh, just across the mall here, uh, Decrim Ann Arbor chapter had a, a, a meeting, a symposium here at the Rackham Auditorium. And one of my friends who was a MSW and a therapist, he came back from that Rackham meeting all breathless and excited about the movement and what great things were happening with human well-being. So, so that was 2019. Then in 2020, the Decrim and Ann Arbor group approached the Ann Arbor City Council and invited us to a fundraiser that they were having at a bar downtown. And so a couple, three of us council members went down there and started to network and learn more about all the research that's been happening. Then the Decrim Nature group started emailing City Council and sending us hard copies of research studies. And this was added a lot, removed the stigma and added a lot of credibility to what was happening. And, and it ended up that Ann Arbor passed the resolution to decriminalize with a unanimous vote. And as you, yes. <laughs> And as you know, after Ann Arbor passed, that opened the door for all the other uh, people, cities in, in Michigan, including Detroit, Ferndale, Hazel Park, and Ypsilanti. So my message today is, if you're feeling like you're a grassroots activist, you don't need to reinvent the wheel because the Decrim Nature Organization has already assembled the toolkit, the toolbox of everything you need. We've got the resolutions, which include the whereas, this is a good thing, and resolved, we're going to decriminalize it. They've got the collection of articles uh, that you can share with your elected officials to convince people and show them what's being done. And then the other big thing is we need people coming to city council meetings to speak during up to three minutes during the public comment period. That was really powerful when people, whether they were a PhD candidate in neuroscience or an existing medical professional or just a person who had been helped and had a personal testimonial, when those folks came to public comment at the city council meeting, it was very powerful. And so uh, I encourage everyone to do that. So thank you to everyone who's been here today. Our work is not done. Um, please make sure you register to vote and exercise your right to vote. Coming, uh, your next chance is November 5. Look carefully for candidates who truly walk the talk and are willing to actively advocate about the issues you care about. So here's to all of your great mental health. Let's have a paradigm shift, end the war on drugs, and open doors for everyone to transformative healing journeys. Thank you, everyone. Woohoo! Thank you so much, Anne. Oh, we're moving the. We're moving. Um, yeah, Anne has been a huge part of planning NTFS too. So she's amazing and doing so much. Um, yeah, appreciate you, Anne. Um, all right, next we have Josie Scoggin as a speaker. She serves as the executive director for the Great Lakes Expungement Network. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing opportunities for formerly formerly incarcerated, incarcerated folks. Uh, Josie is currently the policy director for the Disabled Youth Alliance of America. She is the president of Sons and Daughters United and the director of development at Freedom Grow. And we are so happy to have you, Josie. Thank you.
Thank you. I'll make it. I'll make it pretty quick. Um, my name is Josie. I am the director of the Great Lakes Expungement Network. We do fee-free, full-service expungements in all of 83 Michigan counties. People are more than their past, but unfortunately, our expungement laws do not cover enough, and they don't protect people who are using etiogens more than one time. If you have more than one charge, it's impossible to expunge either of them. It makes it difficult for people who are looking at a, a future legal movement um, to enter, but it makes it harder for people to participate in everyday life. And people want to go on field trips with their kids. They want to coach Little League. They did the crime. They did the time. How long can they pay for it? Here in Michigan, it turns out an eternity. And what do you do when your crime is being poor, when you just couldn't afford an attorney, when you weren't in Washtenaw County, but you were from Benton Harbor like us? What do you do when the people you vote for don't, aren't in favor of progressive change in drug policy? Remember, people like me, whatever way you take that, women who talk too much, people in wheelchairs, we don't get a shot to do a lot. But here in Michigan, you can do whatever you put your, your heart into. And you don't have to be rich, and you don't have to be able-bodied. You just really have to give a shit. But hard work is not enough. It is the community that you build. It is people like this coming together, putting their resources together, putting their brains together. If you would like to possess mushrooms in your own goddamn home because you're 21 and older. You can make that possible. Please go visit our friends at Decriminalize Nature. Do this in your community. And the smaller the municipality, the easier the vote. Right? Thank you guys for having me out. Also, if you need an expungement, I am your motherfucking girl, okay? We do fee-free, full-service expungements. We built this. It's a grassroots organization. You're totally right. I have no money. We had nothing but the idea that we could do it. We could do it better than anybody else. And professionalism is just that. It is showing up and doing what you said you were going to do. Right? It is doing it better than everyone else. It's not, not swearing on the microphone, or at least not in my definition. So please come visit Democrat Decriminalize Nature, and please come get an expungement from me. Thank you guys for having us out. All right, thank you so much, Josie. Next we have Katherine Hankis. She is a senior at the University of Michigan pursuing her Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience. Uh, she's the current president of a nonprofit called The Lookout Project, and they're dedicated to opioid overdose pre prevention. Uh, SAPS did a collab with them, and it went awesome, and we have just appreciated you so much, Katherine, and thank you for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I really feel honored to be able to speak to all of you. Um, like she said, my name is Katherine Hankus. I'm the cur current president of the Lookout Project and our mission is to equip college students to respond to opioid overdose. The Lookout Project believes that everyone deserves agency over their own mind and their own life. Substance use disorders and the opioid epidemic have taken away this control and freedom for way too many. When we look at the staggering quantity of overdose deaths that occur in this country each year, over 100,000, 100,000 in 2023 alone, we are faced with a choice. We can continue to enable a culture of stigma, condescension, and misunderstanding surrounding drug use and continue to criminalize those suffering from a life-threatening disease, or we can approach this issue with empathy and research-informed strategies, 
which points to inclusion, community, and understanding as pillars of recovery. Many people and places are already taking this approach and developing life-saving solutions. Right now, the Lookout Project is handing out free intranasal naloxone with the power to reverse an, op an overdose within minutes. But many people and places are still lagging behind. America is one of those places. Since the 1980s, over 147 overdose prevention centers and over 16 developed countries have opened their doors. These are places where people's lives are cared about, where second chances are believed in, where people can use substances in a controlled environment with a whole team of emergency response professionals, social workers, and peer recovery coaches trained in safe use practices and overdose reversal can assist. This offers a place for those hoping to reduce risk and potentially seek recovery to be seen, heard, and helped. It brings those often overlooked out of isolation and into a community of people that care about their health and their agency. But in the United States, these places are still illegal under the federal crack house statute. Our country continues to sweep this issue under the rug, expecting those struggling to somehow become sober before qualifying for things like transitional housing. This is a double standard that is completely antithetical to holistic treatment. Before I came to the University of Michigan, and founded the Lookout Project as a registered student organization here, I lived at home in Vermont. The summer before I moved away, my cousin Brian, who I spent every Christmas with, who helped to teach me how to swim, who played the saxophone like nobody else, consumed a substance laced with fentanyl and died. He was dependent on opioids and I didn't know. I often can't help that things would be different, can't help but think things would be different if he didn't feel so alone in things, if he had had an overdose prevention center to go to anonymously and ask about recovery, if I had been there with Narcan with me. We can't talk about decriminalizing and expanding awareness without talking about the opioid epidemic and the steps we must take to make sure that nobody else has to die. The Lookout Project continues to strive for overdose prevention centers what we believe to be the gold standard of overdose death reduction, disease prevention, and increased access to treatment. Earlier this year, we won the Op Optimize Social Innovation Challenge and earned $10,000 to advocate for overdose prevention centers. We are beginning what we call our Harm Reduction Initiative, which begins with highlighting personal and professional perspectives on fighting the opioid epidemic on our new podcast, The Lookout Podcast. We partner with amazing organizations such as the Prison Birth Project and Students for Decarceration to discuss the inextricable link between the devastating effects of incarceration and overdose rates. And of course, the Student Association for Psychedelic Studies, where we hope for a brighter future of pain reduction without the addictive consequences. Please come see us at our table to get free Narcan and learn more about our work toward a more healthy and connected community. Thank you so much. Give it up, everybody. Thank you so much for still sticking around. It is getting, uh, you know, kind of damp out there, and we're going to keep on going pretty fast here. Uh, I want to bring up Yusuf Rabi. He's a county commissioner here in beautiful Washtenaw County. Um, he uh, served as a House of Representative member for a long time for the 53rd District, which is right here. And um, he was a Democratic floor leader back in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round, a big round of applause for Yusuf Rabi. I got them tongue-tied. Yes. <laughs> well, I love the rain. I don't know. It's, the moisture is good because uh, mushrooms grow in moisture, right? That's what you need. So the rain is good. The rain is a blessing. The rain is a blessing. So I'm going to be quick because we know that weather is coming, and it is an honor to be here today to be asked to speak once again. I believe I was at the very first Entheo Fest and uh, have continued to come ever since. So this is a marvelous event, one where we all come together to fight for what is right. And what I have said in years past, I'm gonna say again, maybe some of you were around before, but really what we are doing here today is a battle against corporate America. 
This is a battle against the pharmaceutical industry, against the people that want to keep us drugged up on their pills. Because the pharmaceutical industry, at the end of the day, corporate America, they don't want you to be able to find your own medicine, to use the earth, and to commune with the earth, and to be one with the earth, to heal yourself from the earth. And at the end of the day, we here in this space, all of you, we've come together to say no more. We've come together to say the earth is our mother. We've come together to say we are going to take a stand against corporate America wanting us to become hooked on their machine. This is about fighting for our earth, fighting for mother nature, and making sure that we can be one with her. Thank you all for being here today. Keep up the fight. Keep up the fight. We will win. Thank you. Give it up for Yusuf Rabi. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, uh, folks, we are um, coming down to the last couple of speakers here. This next gentleman is leading the way right now with Decrim Nature to help those uh, laws get passed here in the state of Michigan. Him and his group, their tents right over there. Josie was talking about them a little earlier. Um, this gentleman's name is Corn. Corn, come on up here, please. Come on, Corn. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction and all the love that uh, Decrim Nature has gotten from other speakers. Um, thank you for the shout out and Bannister and Josie from the Expungement Network. Um, and what they said is 100 percent on point. All of the documents that were used in both the Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti campaigns, and Ypsilanti did just get flipped in less than 90 days uh, from November to January, and the resolution was introduced and passed. Um, so all of those documents, uh, the template uh, for the educational packet that was presented to council, all of that is available through a QR code and a Google group. So you can take that to your municipality. All it takes is two city council members to get something put on the agenda. And if you guys get in touch with us, we would love to send a team out to help with that initial presentation. Um, and if it, if it takes more than that, we'd love to work with you on more than that, too. We're really lucky here in Washtenaw County, like some folks have said, we have a pretty progressive prosecutor. Um, he took the Ann Arbor policy and adopted it countywide. Um, which, again, is great when it comes to being prosecuted, but it doesn't stop the cops from stopping you, shaking you down, taking your shit, and holding you overnight. So what we want is the municipalities to get in line and tell the law enforcement agencies to leave people alone. We have the sheriff. I don't know if she's here still, but I, I heard her say she doesn't think people should be arrested for possessing and using drugs. So I, that sounded like the beginning of a... a directive to the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office to make use and possession of substances the low priority. Um, maybe we could get that on the books. Um, so I would, I would love to have a conversation with her if she's still around. Um, and I, we're actually, last year when I talked to you guys, I talked to you about trying to get drug checking started um, because again, this overdose crisis that we're in nationally has been impacting our friends in the state and in Washtenaw County um, very, very drastically. And so again, there are harm reduction efforts that are constantly, constantly trying to activate in these municipalities in our state. And we're blocked by, again, drug policy. We're, we're blocked. We can't save lives because the war on drugs is blocking us. So what our, our progressive county prosecutor has done is he's provided us a letter of intent that says we can start drug checking in Washtenaw County and he will not 
prosecute anyone for possession of drug checking technology or trace amounts when in good faith utilizing drug checking services. And we have this in writing. So hopefully that's going to get turned into a policy here soon. We're going to start the first quantitative drug checking program outside of Grand Rapids in the state. Um, we should be opening doors around November, December of this year. Uh, we're partnered with Grand Rapids Red Project on that. They've been running uh, semi-quantitative drug checking for the last three years, and the program has worked out great. Um, we have a way better understanding of what the drug supply looks like in that area and what the best interventions would be to reduce overdose fatalities. So um, we're looking to get that started, not just in Ipsy, but across the county. Um, and again, if you guys want this in your municipality, if you're not from Washtenaw County and you want to make this happen, just come scan that QR code get in the Google group, and we would love to help kind of spread this. At the end of the day, our friends, our family members are out here dying because, like, like Yusuf Ravi said, it's a money thing, and it's also it's a greed thing. So we need to stop dying for greed. At the end of the day, we do have the power on the municipal level to make these changes. Um, so I hope you guys get activated. I know, I know my psychedelic community, y'all out here fully activated. So let's activate on the city governments. Let's activate on these municipalities and, and get some of, these change, some of these changes made for folks who feel like it could never happen. At the end of the day, I think 10 years ago, a lot of us out here felt like this could never happen. So every year I come out here, um, I'm, I'm amazed a little bit more to see what's changing just in my lifetime. So y'all keep up the good work. And again, if you wanna get involved, just come holler at us. It's the green canopy on the right over here, um, stage right. So much love. That's Corn Williams, everybody. Give it up for him. And we got to give, give him our attention. Find him online. Find Decrypt online. Go to that green tent over there he mentioned. Um, and, uh, and support Decrypt so we can get this done in the state and move on to bigger and better things. Um, we're coming to the end here, guys. Uh, a couple more speakers. This next person has been paramount in this year's EntheoFest as president of SAPS, the Students Association for Psychedelic Studies. Emily Berriman has really taken uh, this this uh, event and turn it into uh, her her own event uh, with her little taste on it. Um, I really appreciate working with her today. She graduated from University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in psychology last year and now is continuing her education as a master of social work student right here again. Uh, she serves as president of SAPS, like I mentioned. Please welcome Emily Berriman. Thanks, Jim. Um, before I speak, I have two things to say. First of all, uh, we still do have an after party right after the event's over. Um, we have someone, Nonsense Man, Zach, he's going to be leading like a walking caravan over there uh, to the rabbit hole. It's on First Street. Uh, we have dedicated and Mighty Swells band playing. Um, it's going to be awesome. So if you want to come after the event, uh, come, come walk with us. We'll have a speaker and he's wearing a top hat too. I don't see him right now, but he's got a top hat on. Um, the other thing is that Jim is super modest and will never talk, like, he doesn't want to be on anything, he doesn't want to talk about how much he's doing, but he has been the core, the core leader of EntheoFest for the past four years, 2021. He started it, and it's, this is, this is his amazing festival, and it's all of our amazing festivals, but he really is the one behind it, and puts so much work and love and care into it, and I just want to give him a round of applause, because really... He, he'll not, he would not want, he'll, he won't talk about it. Um, thank you guys. Um, but yeah, like he said, my name is Emily Behrman. I am a master's student in social work here. Uh, I'm studying or specializing in interpersonal practice, mental health and substance abuse. I'm in my first year. Um, and I'm also the president of the Student Association for Psychedelic Studies, SAPS, and it has been such a pleasure and such a joy to be a part of it. Um, SAPS is my, yeah, I found my community there. Um, SAPS was founded six years ago in 2018 by Taryn Schiff, Meredith Bauman, and Adam Whiteley, 
and they were all grad students in the School of Social Work, and it was a really tiny club. There was not that many people who came to the first couple couple years of those meetings, and in the past few years, it's, it's ramped up. SAFS has lots of undergrads, we have a lot of grad students, we have community members, we're, we're open to everyone, um, and, and we have a lot of love in our club, um, and it's awesome to see how much it's taken off. Um, we have, our, we have speaker events, that's kind of our main thing. We have speakers come and talk about the research they're doing and talk about the therapy they're doing and we would love to have some more people in. We wanna have like mycologists come and po people in policy and uh, another one of our, our tenants is to really have some more indigenous voices too because that's a huge part of this movement and, and SAPS wants to, we're committed to to keeping all these things alive and to having interdisciplinary um, uh, people and speakers come to our club meetings. Um, because we're rooted in the School of Social Work, we're huge talking about the mental health and the therapeutic aspects of psychedelic medicine. Um, we talk about amazing testimonies people have and it's, it's amazing to hear your, like your story, Brandon, I mean, thank you for being here and thanks for talking about your story. It's, it's touching, uh, so powerful. Um, and we also talk about the adverse effects that some people have. It's, it's not a panacea and uh, certain people don't have, you know, certain people might, might uh, you might not encourage them to take them, different, different disorders or different experiences. And so you have to be careful and we really try to also um, emphasize harm reduction too, but everyone's great experiences with these, with these substances are amazing and we love talking about the potential and we all see it and we all are excited about it. Um, uh, yeah, so SAPS is, is a safe space to talk about psychedelic medicine, to talk about our experiences and to have a community. Um, and, and I feel lucky to be here and lucky to be the president this year. Um, and we're also extremely lucky to be officially sponsored by the Michigan Psychedelic Center, um, founded by Dr. George Mishore in 2022. Um, their mission is to advance engagement and education in the field of psychedelic medicine. And I don't have my little sheet. Yes, I'm gonna get the sheet. Um, so yeah, Michigan Psychedelic Center, we love you. Thank you for sponsoring us. Um, and without further ado, I am going to introduce you to our keynote speaker of NDFS 2024. Uh, we have Dr. George Mishore, who, like I said, he's the founder of Michigan Psychedelic Center. Um, when uh, he did his res residency at Harvard, and when that finished, Dr. George began at the University of Michigan as a fellow in neuroanesthesiology. In 2007, he joined their faculty as an assistant professor, and he worked as an associate dean for clinical and translational research, studying neurological mechanisms. In 2016, Dr. Mature was named the executive director of translational research in the U of M Office of Research. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine in recognition of his major contributions to the advancement of the medical sciences, healthcare, and public health. He is an appointed chair at U of M's Department of Anesthesiology and the Robert B. Sweet Professor of Anesthesiology. In 2021, Dr. Mishore received the American Society of Anesthesiologists Excellence in Research Award for his significant work on the neurobiology of consciousness and unconsciousness, as well as his contributions to academic anesthesiology and translational science. Um, he's awesome. He's been a joy to work with and communicate with, and he's, we're, we're just so, so honored to have you here. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Without further ado, Dr. George Mishore. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm, oh, thank you. I'm so honored to be here, and I just want to start by expressing gratitude, uh, first of all, to Emily uh, for that very, very kind and generous introduction, as well as the invitation to speak for all of her efforts this year, to Jim, uh, to all of the organizers, to SAPS uh, for their sponsorship and organization, as well as all the work that they do. Uh, to the other organizers, to the speakers, so many inspiring advocates, 
pioneers, activists. Uh, and finally, to all of you uh, for being here uh, and also for all the work that you do in the community. So I'm really, really honored to be here. Emily had asked me to talk a little bit about my personal journey and academic journey leading to the Michigan Psychedelic Center. I'm going to try to keep it brief given the, uh, given the weather, um, but really it revolves around consciousness because that is my fundamental interest. And it became my fundamental interest when I was studying philosophy as an undergraduate student, uh, and in particular, the philosophy of mind. I was a junior, and I was reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which was published in 1781. One person applauded. Um, but this had a profound impact on me. And I just knew, as I was reading this, that I had to make consciousness part of my formal professional life somehow. Uh, I was an abysmal science and math student in high school, but I, I knew that I was going to have to try to overcome that uh, and re-engage to understand the neurobiology of consciousness, found my way to medical school and a, a PhD in neuroscience. And, and I have to note that when I was getting my PhD in neuroscience, when I was starting, there really wasn't a field of consciousness science. Uh, consciousness was really considered taboo uh, to study in the academic setting, and it was really marginalized and stigmatized for most of the 20th century. It's a rather recent phenomenon that it's been accepted in the academic setting. So that journey led to uh, psychiatry and an interest in psychoanalysis, uh, but I pivoted from there, as Emily noted, to anesthesiology. Uh, which I found fascinating clinically to be really a kind of guide uh, to people on a, a very vulnerable journey uh, during surgery and to prevent the trauma of surgery and the pain related to surgery, but also to learn how to use a really powerful set of tools to modulate consciousness. And then I came here to the University of Michigan and made a decision to focus my academic career on consciousness. So why study consciousness? Well, for me, it's not just an interesting academic question. It's just the question. Uh, it has profound scientific implications, but also clinical implications, philosophical implications, ethical implications, artistic, theological, and ultimately existential implications. Because no matter who you are and where you come from, what you're interested in, we all woke up this morning, and this world showed up for us in one way or another. And that is miraculous and mysterious. Now, I need to admit that as a faculty member here at this wonderful research university of ours, I'm prone to certain biases. And each faculty member here believes that what they're studying is the most important, the most fundamental, the most essential question uh, to study. And I must admit with honesty and humility that I'm also prone to that bias. But where I differ from my colleagues is that I'm actually correct. <laughs> uh, consciousness is the most fundamental. And I'm not alone in thinking this. Thank you, yes. You know, when the journal Science, this is a really prestigious old journal uh, of scientific inquiry, celebrated its 125th anniversary, it generated a list of the most important questions in science that had yet to be answered. The top 25 and then another 100. So 125 questions for 125 years. The number two question on that list was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And it only lost out to, what is the universe made of? So that's not too shabby to come in second place. But I would argue that they got the order wrong because we only have a concept of a universe because of our conscious experience. And in fact, one might even argue that what the universe is made of is consciousness. So the questions might even really be 
fused as one. So this, I believe, is a fundamental question, not just for the academy, but for our existence. T.H. Huxley, who was a famous evolutionary biologist, had an interesting quotation. He was a contemporary of Darwin. And he said that something so remarkable as consciousness should arise from the irritation of nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the genie when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. And I think that's a, a cool quotation. And I don't know how the genie gets out of the lamp, but as an anesthesiologist, I have drugs that can put the genie back into the lamp in about five seconds, 100% of the time. These drugs are infallible. And they represent powerful tools to modulate consciousness and understand what the brain is doing when it's in a, in a wakeful state and what might be happening when consciousness goes away, but a lot of really important brain functions remain. And so when I started as a faculty member here, I started a community, not just of anesthesiologists, but neuroscientists, physiologists, physicists, biomedical engineers, psychologists, and even philosophers who worked in the lab. And we worked together to start to understand consciousness. And in 2014, I founded the Center for Consciousness Science. And it celebrated its 10th anniversary this past summer. Um, and it's really matured and, and developed in a beautiful way with a lot of wonderful people pursuing this in a number of different ways. And that was the beginning of a, an evolution to psychedelics. So the year after I founded that center, I and my colleague Rick Harris, who is a wonderful human being, left for UC Irvine, we got a grant from the NIH to study two very unusual anesthetics, nitrous oxide and ketamine. And you are probably familiar with the fact that at lower doses, at sub-anesthetic doses, these drugs are also psychedelics. Now, some people argue that they should be formally classified as psychedelics. I think they should. Maybe you can call them non-classical psychedelics. But we received a grant to study their anesthetic and their sub-anesthetic properties because they're also potent analgesics. They're painkillers. They're also known to be antidepressants. But I thought, well, we have this NIH grant. Maybe we can also study the altered states. And that was really our first formal study of psychedelics. I might note, in case you are unaware, that the first studies of ketamine in humans happened right here at the University of Michigan. Did you, did you know that? So um, have any of you heard the term dissociatives before? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Of course, this crowd knows what dissociatives are. You're probably knowing it right now. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, that actually, that term was coined here. So Edward Domino was a professor of pharmacology, and Gunter Corson was a professor of anesthesiology, and they worked together uh, to take this new drug, which was a derivative of phencyclidine, PCP, and ketamine was synthesized in Detroit. The, the story's a Michigan one. Um, and they, they studied it in humans, and Ed Domino went home and was telling his wife at the dinner table, this is a very different anesthetic. These people look spaced out, their eyes are open, and when they finally can talk again, they, they're talking about how they're floating and they're spacey and they're trippy. And her response was, wow, it sounds like a dissociative anesthetic. And that phrase made its way into the title of the first clinical article, and the rest is history. That came up in the mid-1960s, and that's where the term originates. So we started studying this in 2015, and in 2016, our Center for Consciousness Science hosted a symposium on altered states of consciousness, including psychedelics. And our keynote speaker was Robin Carhart Harris. And you probably have heard that name if you're familiar with some of the ongoing studies. He's been a real pioneer in this renaissance of psychedelic neuroscience. So things were starting to move. 
And we knew that other people were starting to study this, but what really drove this movement at the University of Michigan was the graduate students. It wasn't me. It was our graduate students, and I want to ha have you help me acknowledge them, because it wasn't the old people, <laughs> it was the young people. They were plugged in, and they were really encouraging us. They had their finger on the pulse of what was happening in the community, and it was really through them that I started to ask myself and talk to my colleagues, wow, maybe, you know, we're studying ketamine and nitrous, but that's still within the realm of anesthesiology. Do we want to make the move uh, to the classical psychedelics? And the answer ended up being yes. And so the graduate students helped us, and, and we have other uh, pioneers who are working at the, at the edges. And Jimo Borjigan, for example, was working on the enzymatic machinery in the human brain that might make DMT on its own. Um, and that was something that she was working on with a graduate student, John Dean. And then we put together a symposium. And I, I let the grad students run it. They got some incredible speakers. And what happened in 2019, in fact, it was September, so it was five years ago, right around this time, excuse me, right around this time, and there was this incredible dynamic crowd that got together. It was supposed to be just an institutional symposium, and we had people driving in and flying in from out of state. Incredible speakers from around the world. And I realized, looking around, and some of you were actually uh, present, I realized we've got a community here, and we can start to build on this community. Now, I became chair of anesthesiology later that year, and then COVID hit, and of course, everything shut down. But a few years later, we started to get things moving again. And in 2021, I started the Michigan Psychedelic Collaborative. I thought, let's do something unofficial and just see what we have here at the university. And in fact, we had a really dynamic community that spread across the campus, not just the medical school, main campus, the arts, uh, pharmacy, the nursing school, uh, the school of music, theater, and dance lots of interested people. And so finally in 2022, I put together a formal application and we formally founded the Michigan Psychedelic Center. Thank you. Now, you know, for a lot of fields, getting the official blessing of the university isn't really a big deal. Yeah, it makes it official. But when you're studying psychedelics, getting the official blessing of the University of Michigan is a big deal because it adds the credibility, it adds the legitimacy, uh, and it allows us to sit alongside with the other academic centers uh, in order to move forward as a, a credible field of science. And what we're doing is really trying to follow the template of the University of Michigan Medical School with the tripartite mission of education, research and service. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in those spaces and what's gone on. So in terms of education, we've hosted different symposia related to psychedelics and, and brought the community in. We've also started new graduate programs, graduate courses in psychedelic neuroscience, and we'll be hosting another one uh, in 2025. In research, we've really made great strides. And there's research going on across the campus. From the very cellular level, questioning current paradigms of how psychedelics work in the brain, going on right here in the Department of Psychology by Omar Ahmed, with National Institutes of Health funding, I might add, uh, which again is really important legitimacy and credibility that helps us advance the field. Uh, we have work going on at the med school, at the next level, thinking about brain networks. We're studying um, healthy volunteers um, who have uh, received, uh, for example, nitrous oxide while we've done brain imaging, the first study of its kind happening right here at the University of Michigan. And I know that you've heard from Dr. Kevin Banke earlier, and I think he's over here somewhere. There he is. Um, Kevin launched it, to my knowledge, and I, I looked through the records, really the first clinical trial 
of psilocybin or any conventional classical psychedelic substance here at the University of Michigan. So that happened through the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center as well as the Michigan Psychedelic Center. And those data are being written up. We've launched another clinical trial for refractory depression, again with psilocybin. Uh, there's a trial on ketamine in the VA population, and we're gonna continue to grow that. Um, and uh, other exciting studies that are being planned. And in fact, we have a study going on that's really cool that brings together psychedelics and anesthetics, which are kind of mirror images of one another, using them to probe theories of consciousness and a very cool study trying to use psychedelics to reverse the effects of anesthetics. So just a, a really novel concept because, again, the, you induce this kind of mirror image state in the brain uh, with anesthetics and psychedelics, and we're seeing whether or not, essentially, they kind of neutralize one another and you generate a normal or ordinary state of wakefulness as a result. So lots of exciting studies grants going in, uh, a, a growing community, um, and importantly, more outreach. And I know that the outreach here at EntheoFest has been an important part of the work with Kevin, Nilafar, Nick Linos, Nick Holman, and others, uh, and others who might be here, uh, Jacob Ade, who has been a wonderful addition to the faculty. And I'm really excited to announce uh, that through the work of Kevin and Nilafar and Jake, that the Michigan Psychedelic Center and the University of Michigan and the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center are gonna be the home to the Global Psychedelic Survey of 2025. Uh, the first one was in 2023. Yeah, this is worth a round of applause. The next one's gonna launch in 2025 and Ann Arbor is gonna be the home of this global psychedelic survey translated into multiple languages. We're gonna be the home for the data and this is just gonna be a, an unprecedented resource um, and not a narrow academic um, resource but really the voice of the community, many communities across the world. So that's something that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, and I'm gonna thank uh, my colleagues over here for helping to make it happen. And you know, it's just a great privilege to utilize the resources that we have available to us at the Michigan Psychedelic Center to promote that kind of engagement. So I'm excited about the next phase. And I, I think, and I, I'm sure that Kevin spoke to this, you know, it's a really, interesting way to have an interface between a university like ours that has to adhere to federal law with a community that, as we know and as we've heard, has an environment where entheogens are decriminalized. We cannot, um, we cannot cross that barrier directly. And so developing ways to kind of harmonize without crossing the barrier is going to be really important. So I'm gonna share my tagline that I always share when I get up and talk or I get interviewed about the center because I think it's really important. We, we've heard a lot about the moment right now that we're in, certainly with the science and with the policy. And we've been in this moment in certain respects before in the 1960s. And I think it's really important, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not lecturing you. This is something I do to lecture my scientific colleagues who sometimes get caught up in the hype. I'm excited about this moment, but just as I believe that we should not stigmatize psychedelic research, we should also not romanticize it. We need to be courageous in this moment, and courageous in a different way that we might usually think about it. We have to have the courage to be careful. We have to have the courage to be conscientious. We have to have the courage to be compliant. We have to have the courage to be circumspect. We want to think about the moment, but I want to think about the long game. I want to think about 50 years from now and 100 years from now, not just the moment. It's easy to talk to you and get a good round of applause. I want to think about what kind of rock solid, credible body of scientific research do I need to go to policymakers who might not be as sympathetic as the people who are here today, or to people in other parts of Michigan 
or the country who might still be operating under the stigmas of the past and to, prevent, uh, to present that credible, rock-solid data and convince them and make it a part and connect uh, the, the grassroots organization with mainstream medicine and have this be a part of our culture for the future. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be here and I wish you a wonderful day and festival. Thank you.